Welcome to But Her Lyrics, the show where we delve into the meaning and politics behind the songs of War on Women and other artists you actually know and love. I'm Shauna Potter, singer and lyricist for War on Women, and your host. If you've been listening for a while, you're very familiar with the sounds of Rosie in the background chewing on an isla bone, and you probably already know that this podcast started out as a way to promote the latest War on Women album, Wonderful Hell, when we couldn't play shows. This season, I'm still tackling select War on Women songs. Check out the previous episodes for a second wave goodbye and say it. But I'm also doing something new. Well, two new things. One, I'll soon have episodes where I interview other artists about their political lyrics, which will get us into some different genres and topics, and I'm really excited about that. But I'm also diving into topics that could and should be War on Women songs, like this episode here. What we're getting into today is an important and difficult conversation that we all need to be having right now. So stay tuned to hear my interview with author Sarah Schulman about her book and the concept that conflict is not abuse. Consider this your general content warning. Before we get too deep, Let me shout out this episode's sponsor, First Defense Krav Maga in Virginia. Check them out. Lovely people there that I've had the pleasure of training in bystander intervention. And a new sponsor, Navarro Hair Design out of Seattle, who offers 20% off extension application services for the trans community. Amazing. Also, shout out to my badass patron, Melissa P., and Marta from Barcelona, who I recently met over there. And I have a couple podcasts to shout out. One is called Peer Pleasure, and it gets deep, like therapy deep, with musicians and artists, including me and even Brooks Harlan, War on Women guitarist, who rarely does things like that. So it was very cool to hear his interview. But the host, Dewey, interviews people way more famous and interesting than us, so check out Peer Pleasure. Also interviewing way more famous people than us is an old boyfriend of mine from my Nashville days, my buddy Toomey. He hosts Talk To Me, which is part of NotFest.com now. And you can listen to full episodes in pod form or check out clips on the NotFest YouTube. I am so freaking proud of him. It's so weird and cool that he gets to interview some of his favorite musicians. And I know how much he loves music because our bands used to play together all the time when I was in high school. I also have been on his show, and we talk a lot about the old days, so if you want to hear two old friends shoot the shit, you can find links to all this stuff and other resources related to this episode in the episode description. Like I said at the top, I was recently lucky enough to travel to Barcelona, where the Spanish translator and publisher of my book, Making Spaces Safer, is based. Orsini Press. Uh, They set up a book talk at a feminist bookstore called La Cabranera. I'm sure I'm butchering that. Um, And one of the questions from the audience was, what was the hardest part of writing your book? And with no hesitation, I said, writing the last chapter. Not the research, not collecting stories, not the endless editing, but writing the chapter on transformative justice. One, it's a big, complicated subject that is difficult to whittle down into a few pages. Two, I'm no expert at it. I have some experience with it, but most of my work is preventative or about what to do in the moment. But I felt that readers deserved at least a jumping off point for figuring out what to do post-incident or after harm has been caused. Since doing the research for that chapter, I've continued learning about different models of justice and accountability, and mostly, it's led me to a lot of questions. How do we define justice if we're striving for a less violent world? A world without prisons? How do we acknowledge the humanity in everyone while understanding that harmful behaviors do not happen for no reason? Especially here in the U.S., where we're spoon-fed this idea that only bad people do bad things and they have to be punished for it. Because frankly, if that's true, then we are all bad people. We are all capable of harm, just like we're all capable of being harmed. And punishment might feel good at first, but how does it break the cycle of violence? Does it make our communities safer in the long run? How do we move away from punishment and ostracization, uh, say that five times fast, and create something new that allows for change and growth? 
I certainly don't have all the answers, but we need to keep asking questions until we find them. What's coming up in this episode might be challenging. I mean, the world just barely agreed that street harassment is bad, so of course we're not fluent in the language and practice of transformative justice. But I'm happy to be challenged, and I hope you are too, by the works of people like Adrian Marie Brown, some of the resources listed in the show notes, and my guest today, Sarah Schulman, author of Conflict is Not Abuse, Overstating Harm, Community Responsibility, and the Duty of Repair. I first heard about her book a couple years ago when Kathleen Hanna, guest vocalist on War on Women's song, You Don't Tell Me How to Live, but a little more widely known for her work with Bikini Kill and La Tigra. Anyway, she posted a photo of the book on Instagram. You'll hear me mention this in the interview, but I immediately tensed up just reading the title of the book. It's hard to describe, but it's like my body was saying, oh, so you don't believe victims? And then my brain was like, that's not what it says. Why did you jump to that? And then I knew I had to read it. I had to find out what was in this dang book and hopefully find out why I had such a reaction to reading the title. You might be feeling tense right now too. So if you are, please stick with me, keep listening, breathe. I promise it'll be worth it. Interview time! Sarah Schulman, I am honored to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, please introduce yourself to everyone. Yes, yeah, so I'm Sarah Schulman. I'm right now in my apartment in the East Village in New York, and I'm a writer and happy to be here. I wanted you on the show because I have read your book. It is sitting right next to me. It is full of pink highlighter all throughout. I think it's extremely valuable for anyone that cares about a less violent world. But I will say the first time that I saw your book, I had a visceral reaction. I kind of tensed up and I almost expected the book to call me a whiny liberal snowflake or something. I assume that is not the first time you've heard something like that. Well, you know, my books usually, or hopefully always, are brand new ideas. Mm. I rarely weigh into a pre-existing debate on one side or the other. So if people haven't read the book, they think they already know what's in it because they think it's that old idea that they heard before. And so that happens a lot. Once they actually read the whole thing, and because I'm a novelist, I work with this kind of cumulative arc where the argument unfolds like a story and you actually have to read the whole thing to get the idea, then um, there's a more nuanced response. Yeah, so let's clear it up. How about um, for anyone listening that maybe is having a similar reaction right now, what is the danger of conflating conflict with abuse? Well, there's a lot, but well, first let me start with my definitions so we know what we're talking about. Okay. To me, abuse is power over. It means that the person who's on the receiving end of the cruelty did not create the situation, did not cause it, and can't stop it. It's out of their hands. Some other entity or group or individual has more power than them. And that's what abuse is. Conflict is a different thing. It's power struggle. And it can be just as painful and it can have dire consequences. But the difference is that the, the multiple parties are participating in the escalation in some way, even if that way is not equal. The, the reason we need to know the difference is that, well, first of all, if you are in a conflict, you have some power to transform it. And that should be desirable information, right? We should want to and be happy to understand that. Right, right. But unfortunately, we're in a situation where perpetrators, and by that I mean Trump, the Israeli state, uh, you know, the police, are constantly positioning themselves as victims falsely to avoid responsibility for their position. And um, this distorting language makes it that when we acknowledge that we are participating in escalating a situation, we then are no longer eligible for compassion. Mm. Because the bar is so high that you have to be a pure, clean, and total victim to be in any way eligible for compassion. And that is a disaster. 
because all people need help. And when people ask for help, they should be able to get it. And it, it's not about whether they are guilty or innocent or anything like that. Right now, we only feel like we're being heard if the party for whom we blame our pain is being punished. That's the connection. That's what it means to us that we've been hurt. But if we could get support and help because we need it, and that could be separate from how we understand the cause of that pain, who we want to project that onto or who is responsible for it, I think we'd all be in better shape because my life anyway has shown me that punishment does not work. I don't think there's any examples of punishment being a successful social dynamic. So th those are some of the reasons that I think it, it's helpful to break this all down. And when people who are actually in conflict position themselves as being abused, then people who are actually abused do not get their situation recognized. So we're in a world where people who are really abused are under-supported and people who and are often perpetrators or involved in creating pain uh, make the false claim of being victims, then they don't have to take any responsibility. So it's a very uneven dynamic. I'm going to ask what people can do about it next. But first, how can people recognize an overstatement of harm? Like, is there a checklist we can go through? How do we know? Well, one thing I, I like to use is going through the order of events. I think that that's always very revealing. So let's say I'm having a conflict with somebody. Okay. And I'm like, he did this, and then he said that, and then he did that, and then I'm, and then I'm like, I smush it when it comes to me. <laughs> and then I go back to everything that he did. Okay. <laughs> right? Right. So, so yeah, when you leave yourself out of it, that's a problem. But usually there's an originating action, and then there's a consequence. So, for example, when people resist, uh, they become stigmatized because the originating action is erased. It's treated as though it's neutral. Mm. So, for example, we say that Palestinians are terrorists, right, or something like that. Instead of saying this, these are a people who have been subjugated, who have been occupied, and who are trying to find some kind of way of transforming their situation. So you leave out the originating action, and then you only pathologize the response. And that happens intimately as well. You know, like the child screams at the mother, and then that becomes a bad child. Of course, I'm I was born in the 50s, so that was the paradigm. Now it's the bad mother. I understand <laughs> that this is switch. But why are they, why are they upset? You know, so it's, it's trying to understand really sources where pain originates can give you a lot of insight. Which I think means that we have to exercise uh, patience and curiosity, right? When we are, when we're told about an incident in our community, like we can't rush to, to judgment, I guess. Well, I think it's actually a time saver to actually talk to people and find out what's really going on. Oh. Like, I think the most effective thing you can do when you're being told to hurt somebody is to ask that person, why do you think this is happening? That question, why do you think this is happening, can give you so much information. Now that I'm older, I know that there are people who had a conflict when they were 20, who at age 60 are still not talking to each other and don't even remember what the originating event was. So even though it takes a little bit of time and it's uncomfortable in the present, you save all this time of your future of hostilities that will exist for no reason. If you just ask people, like pick up the phone and ask them, why is this happening? Because we're always being asked to hurt people. Like I'm constantly being told, why are you working with that person? Mm. Why did you invite them? You know, da, 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 da. Like we're always being told that. Or if someone we identify with, whether it's your friend or someone in your clique or someone in your religious group or whatever, if that person is mad at a third party, you're supposed to hate that other party forever. Like your friend's ex-boyfriend, you're supposed to hate him forever. Right. Because that's how we show loyalty. But that's not really loyalty. I think real loyalty is helping people negotiate, giving them, to, giving them support for being self-critical and not abandoning them when they acknowledge that they've participated in escalating a situation. So 
other than maybe uh, not, not ignoring, not shunning the other person, asking, why do you think this is happening? Is there anything else that, uh, you know, the audience or the friends or the allies of, of these, of the parties involved, um, anything else that they should be doing in the face of an allegation of abuse, especially when it's fairly clear that it is an overstatement of harm? Like, what, how, how can they help everyone move to repair? Well, right now we have a lot of negative bonds that create our communities, you know, families who unite around the one family member who they blame for everything, <laughs> cliques who <laughs> shun the one person who told them the truth about themselves. You know, as a Jewish person, I'm supposed to support Israel because my relatives live there, like the family. There's all these kind of negative bonds that transcend what is actually happening, that overwhelm the, the truth of people's complexities. And, and you know, um, just asking questions and trying to get real conversations and negotiating and rethinking dynamics is what breaks all this down. Like right now, as we're talking, we're in the middle of this horrible Russian assault on Ukraine, right? And we're watching these countries, Spain, Ireland, Poland, they're opening their borders to the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees, as they should. But for years, they have been keeping out Syrians. They've been keeping out Africans. They've been putting non-white, non-Christian refugees into camps for years, for decades. You know, And it's like, this is something that we need to question. Or let's see, see this opportunity Yes, Russia is occupying, militarily occupying Ukraine, but Israel is occupying Palestine. But Saudi Arabia is invading, is occupying Yemen. Why are we only having empathy when when they resemble, quote, resemble us racially or religiously? Right. So these opportunities to think and expand how we understand our relationships. And how would that work on the, you know, I'm thinking of my audience with music lovers and small communities. how would that work for us? What, what what do we do in our communities when there is an overstatement of harm? Well, I think the first thing you do is you talk, I mean, speak to the person who's being vilified. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just ask, I mean, whatever happened, people do things for reasons and there's misunderstandings and sometimes people do bad things. You know, we're, we are human. And don't forget, there are people who want to have reconciliation with the person who murdered their parents. <laughs> right. There are all kinds of like gestures towards reconciliation. So why should you be mean to someone forever because they sent an email that and perhaps you misread? Yeah. At what point does the pursuit of justice turn into the abuse of others? Sometimes right away. I mean, I've seen that happen. Like I've seen um, restorative justice processes become like vigilante and, you know, people doing uncool things being treated like major crimes against humanity and being used to discredit people. And I, again, I think it always comes back to face-to-face conversation, asking questions, being willing to be uncomfortable and not having a pack mentality because you need to have supremacy ideology to shun somebody. You know, it's only if you, if you don't think that you're better than them that you can negotiate with them. Mm. You have the part your partner in conflict must be your equal for you to have any kind of resolution. What do you wish more people would ask you about your work or this particular book? I I don't know. It's it's such a weird response. You know, I've written 20 books, right? And this book has had the weirdest response of all. <laughs> really? Because most people who respond Tell to me it have that. well they haven't read it. So <laughs> I mean, almost every day there's something mean on Twitter about this book that has nothing to do with the book. Wow. It's because before it was published, uh, this one person whose name I'm not going to say put something out there claiming that the book told people to call the police, which, of course, is the opposite of what the book is saying. But the book had not even been printed yet, so they had not read it. And this thing was retweeted like thousands of times. And for years now, I've been swimming upstream against that. Oh, no. So there's there's just this constant rhetoric of people who have not read the book or they've only read an, the excerpt that's on Amazon 
which is primarily about interpersonal relationships. And they don't see how it's the beginning of an argument that extends to geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And they feel so personally implicated because they're so invested in being the pure victim, right? That they then condemn the whole book that they haven't read. Yeah. Or some people have just read the part of the title that says not abuse. Yeah. And they think that I'm taking away their hard won realization about their abuse. But, you know, a book should be a development of ideas. And I'm one of those writers who puts out lots of ideas. And some of them are stronger than others. There are some ideas in this book that are wonky. I, I know that. But there are also some ideas that I think are very rigorous. And the thing that I think really is the strongest is the idea that dominant culture people can be offended and threatened by difference, but so can traumatize people. And, you know, it's for different reasons, but we have to really be aware of that as well. That just because someone else's difference makes you feel uncomfortable about yourself. And sometimes when you're traumatized, it's so hard to just keep it together that the thought of having to be self-critical is overwhelming, that doesn't mean the other person is hurting you, mm. right? It's because we have unresolved pain from the past, you know, and we are often asking the present to solve our unresolved pain from the past, but the present didn't create that pain and it can't solve it. So it's just, you know, awareness, more awareness. Now, you don't have to answer this, but have you ever reached out to the person who incorrectly tweeted about this saying to call the cops and tried to work something out with conflict? Resolution? I certainly have. So every time I see her, I say, hi, how are you? <laughs> and, so, some, and sometimes she says, hi. But I ran into her at a Taylor Mac concert and I had the book with me. It had just finally been printed and she had been circulating these false things for a long time. And I said, would you like a copy of this book? And she said, sure. And I handed it to her. So now I know she has it. But she's never like apologized or retracted or anything. <laughs> and it just goes on and on. Yeah. yeah. Being implicated is not an assault. Like reading a book that makes you question yourself, that's good. You know, it doesn't mean that you're being hurt. I just wonder if, and, 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 and I just, I'm using you as the example because this is a great, uh, it's a good one. Let's say if, if you just wanted an apology because she put out false information about you. If that's your reasoning for wanting to like do some sort of more official mediation or conflict resolution, would you do you think that 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 is a good enough reason or would you say if that's all I want out of this then that actually isn't the goal and it's a disservice to to what the conflict resolution could be. I've actually offered her a wide range of things. Like I offered to her that we could have a public discussion about the book. Mm. I've offered that we could have a private discussion about the book that could be mediated or could be just the two of us, but she has refused all of that. There's also another person who um, had asked me to get involved in group bullying of somebody. And I immediately called that person. And after I heard what they said, I said that I didn't agree with this. And I told her that. And then she reviewed the book and misrepresented the ideas and it was inaccurate. And the publisher, the editor did not fact check. And this woman has been unable to take responsibility for that for like so many years now. And every once in a while, she gets on Twitter and says something. And every time I message her privately, and I'm like, why don't we get together and compare the text to your review? We can have other people there, we could do it in public, <laughs> we could do, and she doesn't answer. Right. And I recently had a thing in Jewish Currents magazine that was very, very disturbing, where um, the, uh, oh, no, this was about my new book, uh, my, my history of ACT UP, but it was a similar construction. So the television show Pose mm -hmm. sh had an episode that showed Black trans women pr being part of the ACT UP 1989 action at St. Patrick's Cathedral. I remember that episode. Yeah, and that's yeah. great that that was on TV, but it never happened in real life. So in my history of ACT UP, when I describe that event, I don't say Black trans women were arrested because they weren't. And But a, there was a reviewer who thought that they were. So she thought I was being transphobic. And she wrote this whole review. And I asked the editor, did you fact check this? And they said, yes, but they couldn't have because it never existed. So, you know, these types of things, misrepresentations and inaccuracies, I do try 
to negotiate them. And sometimes people can't. But anyway, I think that that's, as far as conflict is not abuse, I think that it creates this kind of sense of paranoia or um, conspiracy, like she's claiming she's one thing, but she's secretly pro-police or whatever. You know, we have a lot of conspiracy thinking paradigms, you know. And at some point, if obviously, if, if they refuse any offer to to speak, then there's, you kind of have to let it go. Well, I, what I haven't done is like said their names publicly and gone into a whole refutation. I'm still trying after years now to resolve it in a one-on-one basis. That's all you can do. Well, is there anything that you'd like to plug right now? And can you tell us where to find you online? Well, um, I'm on, I'm very available, so I'm very easy to find. I'm, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> Th- thanks. You know, thankfully for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I guess my most recent book is Let the Record Show, Political History of Act Up New York, 1987 to 1993. Thank you so much for joining me, Sarah. I really appreciate you taking some time to speak with me. Thank you. And best of luck to your band and good luck with your music. How did that feel, listening to that interview? Was it tough? Did it make sense? There are a couple ideas from my conversation with Sarah that really hit home for me. One, that overstatements of harm are possible. So if you've been on the receiving end of that, it is real and you're not alone. Two, that they can cover up the real source of pain that someone is experiencing which means that revenge or a cancellation campaign might feel good in the moment, but it won't provide the long-term healing people need and deserve. Three, overstatements of harm can make it more difficult to give our support and resources to victims of abuse, sexual assault, and rape. And lastly, that talking things out, however difficult it might seem, actually saves time and brain space in the end and is usually worth doing. Now, of course, I can expect a right-winger or someone else with ill intentions to willfully misrepresent these ideas and jump to the ridiculous conclusion that I don't support or Sarah doesn't support victims and survivors. Of course we do. It's kind of not even what we're talking about. And we can't let the fear of someone twisting our words prevent us from talking about the messy bits of this work. Frankly, that's what keeps people from calling out overstatements of harm, which are sometimes themselves a form of harm. But we must have these conversations. We must deepen our understanding and empathy for how people really are and what we're really capable of in order to make the world a less violent place. I talk in my book that public callouts are one tool in our toolbox. And they are great. They are great against faceless corporations or active threats that warrant urgency or when other more productive options to resolve issues have been exhausted, you know, like when victims and survivors have tried other avenues and have been willfully ignored. But if it's possible, when in conflict, in-person communication has a better and proven track record. So maybe now you're asking, Okay, so what the fuck am I supposed to do? (laughs) In the show notes, there is a link to an infographic that walks you through the process of what to do if you hear a complaint of harm. Full disclosure, I helped write it, which is why it's from the point of view of a band, but it pulls from many sources. To sum up, it centers hearing the person out first, whoever's making the complaint, listen to them, but it also leaves room for conversation around the allegations of harm. So here's how we start. If someone tells you they have experienced harm, abuse, violence, assault, etc., believe them. Yeah, even if somehow you were there and you know it didn't happen the way they remember it, believe them enough to help them because clearly they're going through something, right? They're upset about something And you can help them by listening and potentially directing them to people who know more than you, right? Like counselors, therapists, crisis text lines with crisis response experts, AA, NA, whatever they need. And if you know the person being called out, your first question to them could be, are you okay? 
And like Sarah said, talk to them to hear their side. Ask, what do you think happened? You might find out enough about the situation to know the best way to help. And if you're not actually close to the people affected, maybe you can urge those who are to check in with them and find a way to help them. If you've been abused, sexually assaulted, or raped, please contact the National Sexual Assault Hotline by calling 1-800-656-HOPE here in the U.S. or by visiting rain.org, R-A-I-N-N.org. This will be in the show notes. And that's where they have a ton of additional resources and ways to get help. If you're able to, get a trauma-informed therapist you feel comfortable being honest with. If you've been using drugs or alcohol to cope, consider a recovery program because it's never too late to start the healing process. And if you are the one with a conflict, which is not the same as abuse or assault, but if you have a conflict with someone and you know you want answers or accountability, but you're not sure what to do, finding an organization or person trained in conflict resolution or community mediation is a great option. So, just like the transformative justice chapter in my book, this podcast is merely a jumping off point. There is no way I could fully cover this topic in one little punk podcast episode. So, I urge you to keep asking questions. Continue thinking about how individuals and communities can stop cycles of violence and come back to harmony and repair. And you can start by checking out the resources in the show notes. You can support this podcast by sharing, subscribing, and reviewing it. It's free, and it helps. To find the transcripts or find out more about what I do, my book, my trainings, my Patreon, head to shaunapotter.com. And to learn about all things War on Women, head to linktree slash war on women. Linktree.e slash war on women. Thanks for listening. Good luck out there. Stay safe. And fuck SCOTUS. <laughs>